Hi, everybody, and welcome. I'm Cole Darty with Dallas Market Center, and joining me is Lori Young, president of Brighton. And just a few words to open up about Brighton. Brighton, since 1991, has been a company that's known for its integrity of designs, but also the integrity of its team. And so I wanted to have a conversation with Laura today to talk through a few important questions about their company and also about retail today. So thank you, Laura, thank for joining you. us. Thanks, Paul. Good Appreciate to be here. Appreciate that very much. So let's start right in and talk for a moment about retail. Okay. We're in very different times, unprecedented times, and it's a challenging time for a lot of different companies. I want to quote the guru Warren Buffett from Wall Street, who says that uh, when the going is tough and things are difficult and the tide goes out, you get to see who's swimming naked. And I know right now uh, we're having to get to see a lot of people who might be uh, exposed or naked, if you will. So right. what do you think it is for companies who are prepared versus unprepared for what we're facing? Well, it's a big question for sure. Um, and he's a smart guy. So I, I, certainly we love him. You know, one of the things I love that he says is he says it takes uh, about 20 years to build a reputation and it takes about five minutes to ruin it. And uh, you find out during these times who's really got the courage to stick with their mission. And, you know, when when I see the things of people running naked, so as you talk about it, you know, obviously debt and high mm -hmm. leverage is is, you know, that's a killer for sure. Um, but one of the things that we see from the retailers that we sell is those people who don't have the data on their customers when they had to shut down is that they were sort of lost. And so I think that data capture, really knowing your customers, whether it's you know phone numbers, emails, uh, all, all the points of contact so that you're able to get a hold of them, that comes that came very clear to us during this time. But definitely debt inventory, inventory will kill you. Um, lots of lots of big retailers have lots of long term leases that are um, you know kind of uh, tough at this point. So those are some of the big things. Well, we can move to another guru, Stanley Marcus, and, and talk for just a second a question about uh, his perception as a master merchant, and uh, you know. What are the keys of being the best merchant possible these days? He was amazing. You know, the world according to Stanley, as they call it, Mark. He was just amazing. He had he was really a true merchant. He had the ability to create exp authentic experiences um, when he was here. And, you know, you would go into the store and you just felt at home. You felt like the staff was really your friend and you, you knew that they had the time to take care of you or if even if they didn't have the time, you didn't feel it, and uh, he had—he really had the ability to um, to make people feel loved, and and you know you got real thank you notes, and um, it was just a different time back then. And I think that back when Stanley was um, in charge and and letting leading it is that retailers had real seasons. They lasted longer. They had a real chance for the product to come in. They created an experience of a launch of a season that lasted for several months at full price. And it gave all the staff in the store really a chance to uh, take good care of the customers. And it wasn't, it wasn't like it is today. Well, let's take a step back from that for a second. You mentioned a couple of things that seems like they're lessons right there. You put your finger on a couple of key points that, that Mr. Stanley implemented that you think could hold value for all retailers. Tick through those again that you just said. Okay. So one is I think that the experiences that were created were real experiences. I mean, I still remember to this day, but I grew up, I lived in East Texas, Marshall, Texas, and I grew up coming here with my mother to Neiman's and I can still remember the sales associate that waited on her. Her name was Mrs. Feldman. And even though we lived two hours away, when we walked, when we got there, she greeted us and it was an experience. You know, we stayed several hours, sometimes over lunch. And, um, and you just got this, this real shopping experience that I think people crave today. And, uh, you know, a lot of specialty stores have this a lot, but a lot of the big department stores and, and big mass retailers, this is not the kind of experience that you get. So I'd say that real shopping experience was, was a big one. And then I, you, you didn't worry what a price, what price was, uh, what a price was. I mean, you just knew that when you were there, that that was the real price and that it was going to go on sale twice a year. And that was it. And you didn't, you didn't wait and you weren't conditioned to buy things on sale. So he sold things more on quality 
workmanship, value, and uh, just real authentic. Well, Laura, next up, let's talk pricing. Okay. We don't see Brighton prices all over the place, up and down and every which way. Why is that? Well, a long time ago, we um, figured out that one of the most important things for our, the integrity of our brand is the trust and confidence that the customer has in our brand and where she buys it and what she pays for it. And um, we have been as concerned about people charging too much as people charging too little. So probably 15 years ago, maybe, long, maybe longer than that, we developed a suggested retail pricing policy for the purpose of making sure that the customer knew that no matter where she shopped for Brighton, she was being treated fairly. It wasn't like it was gonna be a flash sale one day and it was going up and then it was going down. That no matter where she bought Brighton, everybody was charging the same price until it was a final sale. So we wanted it to be a real sale if it was going on sale. And also we don't allow our retailers to put anything online on sale, okay, um, on sale, only for sale. So um, that's just been a kind of a cornerstone of our brand is that customers trust it. I remember um, a quick story is that uh, we had a customer, and this is kind of what triggered us, one of the things, we had a customer in um, that was from Florida. She was in she was in Phoenix at the Hyatt Gandy Ranch. She bought a belt there. It was supposed to be about $65. She paid about $95. She got back to our little boutique in Plantation, Florida, only to find out it was supposed to be $65. And she was mad at us. Now, you know, we said, call Mr. Hyatt. You know, we, it was the right, wasn't the right price. And so that kind of triggered our brain to say, customers, it is our brand and customers need to be treated fairly. And that's, that's why you see it. Next up, let's talk about product. And there's a sense with Brighton of having core product or ongoing product versus new, new, new. Talk for a second about that philosophy, but also specifically during the pandemic, how you approached core product. Okay. So we, um, most of the things that we sell are classic. They're timeless. They're not real seasonal. We have a little straw in the summer. We, we have seasonal product, but in any given month, it never really represents more than about 25% of the business. So we can sell things day in, day out, um, and, and customers can reorder things. Um, co consumers know that they can you know, add things to, to core collections over time. And so we've just um, always prided ourselves on making timeless core classic product that doesn't go out of style. And it's a big help too for the retailers because they don't have to mark it down and they can get full margin value out of it. And the consumers know that she can, if she's looking for that particular uh, collection, she knows that it's in the line for seasons. So it's just been a, a big help to us. And talk for a second about during the pandemic, collections from the archives or collections oh, yeah. that you previously had that you resurrected. So we have a pretty wide range of product. We have probably have 10,000 SKUs in, in our collection. And I joke with our team all the time, if we didn't come out with one new product for a year, um, we'd probably be okay. And of course, most people, believe everybody wants new, 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 new. Um, so during the pandemic, when we had to close, the, close our factory and shutter all of our stores, and um, we said, what are we gonna do? Our only source of revenue was our e-com business. So we had to look at the inventory that we had and figure out how to romance it, how to tell stories, how to share stories. So we brought things out of the archives. We bring things that maybe would never make it past page 13, and we'd bring them to the front and re-merchandise the story about turquoise and customers would relate to it. This, this happens to be from our Bally collection that we launched 17 years ago and we opened the archives. We brought the product out. We literally had to polish it. It's silver. And um, we reintroduced it and it was incredible. And so we basically just realized all the interesting stories and details and craftsmanship and design elements of our products. And we shared stories and the customers really resonated with it. And we sold it 100% at full price. Not one thing, there was not one thing new for three months on our website and nothing for sa uh, on sale, no, no discounts, not one. So what's the lesson there for the average retailer given the, the, the chase of the new, new, new? I think the lesson there is that, you know, when you go to market and you buy product, you buy things you fall in love with. 
and then you get them back into the store and it's how you merchandise the product in the store and how you educate your staff to share what's interesting and special to the customer because anybody can say, well, this is new or this is the hot seller, but what is it about the product that resonates with the customer? So I think be storytellers, be storytellers, re-merchandise the store, you know, move that table from the front to the back, move that sweater and merchandise it with something else and, and go back to being a real merchant. Well, speaking of being a real merchant and the basics and formula for success, uh, you told me recently about the formula that exists for the independent retailer and that formula that you learned from Mahmoud, I believe it was, with Papagayo, who said there's some basics here that he operates and that helped you understand, I think, a basic retail formula. Could you share that? So we were at a sales, we were at a, not a sales meeting, a retailer meeting once where we had lots of retailers that had come to California and just to brainstorm ideas. And, and Mahmoud raised his hand and everybody was talking about how you make money in retail. And he said, look, it's real simple for me. I figure out what it takes for me to be profitable. And he said, I figured out it doesn't take thousands of customers. If I take if I target 150 customers that buy $5,000 a year from me, that's a $750,000 business and I'm profitable and I feel good about that. And all the other hundreds of customers that come in and out day in, day out, 365 days a year, that's like the icing, like the cherry. And so the lesson there is whether it's a 500 customers that do $2,000 with you a year, whatever the formula is, is that if a retailer will really figure out what, how many customers it takes at how much value to keep them in business, I think you get laser focused on taking care of them. I mean, he makes the staff call them for their birthdays, make sure that if anything new comes in, they know about it. They're the first to be invited to the semi-annual sales. So they, he really wraps his arm around these customers and he holds his staff accountable. I think that's a great transition to another topic, which is loyalty. And Brighton has done a fantastic job of creating brand loyalty, but it's done differently than like an airline or even a major department store. You guys approach it in a new way. What's the Brighton approach to building loyalty? Well, first of all, we like to say um, our, in our stores and with our pack, customers, we like to say, you got to practice good manners. Okay. You got to start with that. But we have a loyalty program for our retail stores and it's not based on points or deals or discounts. It's nothing. You don't get anything off. It's based on extra services and it's based on special events and it's based on the way that we treat the customer. So the VIPs are invited to special events multiple times every month. And um, these are, events are really special and they come and they, they all often receive um, an inspiration from a designer. Sometimes we've had the designers do a sketch of their art and there's, uh, you know, we'll have, you know, each one will get a party favor for it. So they know that they have these special things that they get. In fact, we actually, once a year, we've, uh, for the last three years, we've had an event where the consumer can, where she's invited, the, only the VIPs, they actually pay their way to fly to Los Angeles. And the first year, we had no idea what would happen. And we entertain them for the day. They meet Jerry and myself and the designers. They see the factory. They see multiple generations of people that have worked there. And um, we had 250 people. The next year, we had 450 people. Last year, we had over 800 people fly to Los Angeles just to meet and see the designers and the magic that happens there. So it's not about deals and discounts for us. It's about making people feel great. Along with making people feel great, uh, and I'll return back to something we were talking about earlier, there's this idea about going slowly and this yes. idea about slowing things down. Now, this could be a personal approach to our own personal lives, but you talk about it and think about it in terms of running a business, but also for the average retailer. What's the kernel of the idea about slowing down? Well, I think that what the, the beauty of slowing down is you have the ability to stop and reflect and really examine what you're doing and why you're doing it. I think that happened to all of us during this pandemic. You saw people stopping and reflecting in their closets and what they, what they were going to wear and what, what they needed to get rid of. But in business, um, you know, I think that this industry has gotten on such a treadmill of fast fashion and, you know, products come in one month and they're already on sale almost before the week's over. And it's just, we're chasing things too fast and it's, we're not able to give that authenticity to the brands. And so for us, 
slowing down is a real gift because it gives us the opportunity to um, really make good decisions. And I think that when you don't slow down, you end up making decisions for the wrong reasons. And, you know, you, you make decisions that sometimes as a brand, you can't take back. And uh, as, as we said, I'll, you only have one chance to get it right and uh, one reputation. And so we think taking it slow is, is better. And, it, you know, I think too, just for the seasons is that um, people really need the opportunity to, to look and see product at full price for a longer period of time. And if people would just slow down, I think they can do that. Switching gears, you're a fan of Mickey Drexler as I am, who was the uh, iconic retailer behind Gap, J. Crew created Madewell. And so Mickey has said that growth is the enemy. Right. And which is a little bit of a confusing statement to make, but you take that to heart. What does he mean? What do you mean by saying or, or liking the idea that growth is the enemy? Well, I think, like I said, it's kind of the opposite of slowing, of slowing down. And what happens is, when you're just chasing top line sales and you're 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 doing things fast 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 to to make your monthly plan to meet the stockholders uh expectations to meet the private equity uh covenants that you need to make people and of course we're we're private so we don't have all of that pressure but i think what he means is that you end up making decisions for the wrong reasons and by slow, by um just focusing on growth rather than profits um you, you make decisions that maybe aren't the best thing. I know that, you know, during all of this time, so many people have examined every expenditure that they make, uh, all the services that they offer, all the things that they do to figure out what's the right thing for them. So I think slowing down and focusing on the bottom line versus just the top line is, um, is the way to go. And he is an amazing merchant, that's for sure. That's for sure. I saw a, a webcast with him just last week in which he was talking about the very same thing, and the idea of how department stores have missed a lot of the core baseline values and how they are, are struggling because of missing some of the baseline values. One of those baseline values, I think, is experience. And you, you alluded to it earlier with Neiman Marcus in the old days. For Brighton, uh, both for selling to the, to the retailer, but also your own retail experience, what do you think today makes for a good retail experience? Well, I think, first of all, um, I'm going to address the independent boutiques first and just say that they have an enormous advantage, in my opinion, because the owner is the buyer, usually. You know, she takes out the trash. She has a vested interest in it. So the experience that you get in a smaller boutique, um, which can be duplicated in multiple stores, depending on the store leader. Um, I think that it's that experience that you get. And, you know, I, I, I talk all the time about chairs. You think about it, remember the bar chairs where you walked in and everybody knew your name. And so I think experience starts with people knowing you when you come in the door or greeting you in a way that makes you feel at home. And it feels authentic. It feels real. It's not just, let me show you my newest specials or let me, you know, may I help you? It's really starts with introducing yourself and getting the name and creating an authentic experience in the store. For brands that sell across multiple channels, you see caution there. They need to be aware of something. What is that? Yeah, and, yeah. My answer will be, yeah, you know, it's it's like if they're going to sell across multiple channels, they have to recognize that's their those are their customers and they're their partners, and they need to row in the same direction with them. Which means don't discount in their face. Okay, so basically me, something like that. All right. So let me. I'll. I'll are you okay with that? Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah, I think absolutely. it's a. No, 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 it's huge. That's important. If they all. I mean, believe me, these guys over here believe it. You know. Okay. So. Let me ask you about brands that sell across multiple channels and there are a lot of them these days they sell retail they sell majors they sell online they sell via all kinds of different channels but you see a cautionary tale there and and some advice for those multi-channel brands what is that i i do because those brands have such big names and they bring such validity to a small store or even a big department store but the caution that i see is that they're discounting on their own site in the face of their customers. So if they're going to sell in multiple channels, and I think it's exciting that they do, and have their own stores and their own online, why ruin it for all of their 
customers, meaning the retailers. And, you know, I, I, I think very strongly that if manufacturers would simply not put their brands on sale online, they wouldn't ruin it for the whole country. And it's sort of like you want them to all sort of band together and say, hey, we're going to protect the retailers that we sell so that our brand's healthy in every channel we sell, not just our own channel. Let's finish up with a question about hope and about uh, even being cheerful. I get an email in my inbox, I think it's every day, it's called Reasons to be Cheerful. And it's celebrating, and we need some celebrating right now, I think, uh, of reasons to have hope and to be cheerful. For you, as a company leader, but also as a consumer, what is it that uh, makes you cheerful? Well, I guess I should start with the most exciting thing that's happened to me um, right before all of this happened is I'm a brand new grandmother. As a matter of fact, my old, our oldest daughter had our first grandson. So uh, that gives me hope and, and joy for the for for our family. Um, but I think that, you know, at, for as a leader, one of the things that's the most inspiring to me are the people that we that I work with. And I think um, keep helping them keep joy and, and happiness at their front is just so important as a leader. But for, for me, it's the people. It's um, the people that you surround yourself with. It's the customers that you sell. We, we, we have lovely people that we sell. These are real people, you know, small boutiques. We don't sell big department stores. And, and so for me, the joy is with the people and, and helping the people. And, you know, our, our business has always been about helping retailers make money and not just sell product to them is help. How do you help them make money? And when they're successful, it brings joy to us because we know that we had a part in it. Well, I think that's a great note to conclude our, our chat. And thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thanks, Cole. All right.